which is a paper great. called well, a presentation called Making Climate okay, Ordinary, yeah. Harnessing Culture and Creativity okay. to Help Envision Our Climate Futures. Julie Doyle is Professor of Media and Communication and Co-Chair of the Center for Research in Spatial, Environmental and Cultural Politics at the University of Brighton. Her research explores how visual media and culture shape climate change in communication and engagement. Professor Doyle has collaborated with visual artists and practitioners and provided consultancy for environmental NGOs and the sustainability communications of the sector. Thank you so much, Julie, for coming all the way and meet us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to be part of the conversation. Um, I'm going to shift the spatial and communicative focus slightly um, and start with a news story that broke on March the 31st, 2017, a polar bear had appeared on the Scottish island of North Uist. Photographic and video evidence was captured by a local resident and sent to the international environmental group WWF, who circulated the story in grainy footage via Twitter. Mainstream UK news outlets uh, picked up the story and ran online and print features, which included visual footage of the polar bear. In apparent contrast to the dominant image of the pristine white polar bear in uh, pristine white habitats, this polar bear looks disheveled and gaunt, seemingly out of place in a green Scottish landscape. Verified by WWF's polar bear tracker, which used radio signals to identify the polar bear's journey as originating from Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic, WWF stated that, quote, this phenomenon of polar bear migration is set to become the new norm as species adapt to the effects of climate change. So in the context of communication about climate change, this story involves a key icon, the polar bear whose plight as an animal species at risk from climate impacts has been consistently campaigned for by environmental groups over the past 20 years. And so the likelihood of a polar bear from the Arctic regions finding itself on the shorelines of a Scottish island in search of food is not far from the realms of reality. Yet this new story was not real. It was fake. An April Fool's joke intended to draw attention again to the accelerating impacts of climate change in the Arctic and the polar bear's plight. But why did this news story work, reproduced without question by much mainstream UK news outlets? So whilst the migration of a polar bear from Scotland, from Arctic to Scotland, may not be a present reality, the narrative of a changing Arctic habitat has enough cultural resonance to make the migration of polar bears sufficiently believable as a news item for a UK audience. Yet amidst the rise in so-called fake news stories and Donald Trump's erasure of all references to global warming and climate change from the White House website and now science from the Environmental Protection Agency's website, how helpful is WWF's fake climate news story in encouraging us to take serious action? Is it helpful to create such climate fictions at a time when the uncertainty of global political action on climate change mitigation is matched by the certainty of accelerated global climate change? Or to put the question another way, how do we engage people in their ordinary lives and make them care about climate change in ways that encourage enable and enable collective action and engagement rather than turning away through disbelief, overwhelm and despair? Indeed, to have the option of turning away is to acknowledge a Western perspective where climate impacts are often perceived as being distant and in the future, not part of our daily life. So WWF's fake news story is on the one hand an attempt to re-engage an audience with the reality of climate impacts that are already happening in the Arctic region and which also have an effect outside this region. Calling on the audience to imagine polar bear migration to the UK is one may, way to make links between the distant and near future and present climate impacts and to encourage action in the present. The new story focuses upon adapting to the impacts of climate change that have already materialised. In the case of the polar bear melting sea ice, the effects of which will be experienced locally and globally by both human and animal species. But what does this news story encourage us to do? WWF asks us to support its climate campaigning work by adopting a polar bear. 
just one of the many charismatic megafauna that WWF encourages us to care about and donate money to help save. Yet such actions can help to work can work to reinforce distinctions between humans and animals, between non-human nature and human culture. As such, polar bears and animal species are something that we are invited to take imaginative ownership of, making it difficult to understand how the impacts of climate change affect all living species. That includes humans within a complex ecosystem. Furthermore, as an icon of climate change, research by Saffron O'Neill and Mike Hume has shown that while the polar bear creates emotional resonance uh, for audiences, it leaves them with feelings of overwhelm and despair. So we might ask, what if WWF had used the image of a human, a climate refugee displaced from her home, seeking shelter on this island? How might audiences comprehend and react to that image and news story? Shock, empathy, anger, fear, fear about the breaching of geographical and national borders by others. What kinds of action would we be encouraged to take? Adopt a climate refugee? So in this talk, I'm going to explore some of the challenges and the possibilities for rethinking how we communicate climate change more effectively in an age where we're already having to adapt to climate change, but we still require major mitigation activities to limit the severity of these changes. This is a temporal act to navigate. Greenhouse gases that have been emitted in the past have an impact in the present. What we emit in the present will impact the future. Even if we stopped all global carbon emissions today, we're already committed to warming through past emissions. These facts are sobering. But I want to demonstrate how climate change, as we know, is not simply a matter of scientific facts or knowledge. It's also a matter of culture and communication, which shapes this knowledge and our engagement with this issue and our ability to participate. For example, using the image of a polar bear or a human to communicate climate migration will engender very different responses. Yet climate-induced human and animal migration are both present and future realities in the unfolding stories of climate change. We all play a role in these unfolding stories, but what kinds of roles do we play? So in this talk, I'm going to argue that climate change needs to be made ordinary. It needs to be made visible as a cultural issue within media and popular culture in order to link to people's emotions and everyday lives and cultural practices. We need to show how climate change is linked to our lifestyles, our identities, our values and practices how we feel about climate change and how we act on these feelings and knowledge. So I'm then going to move on to explore how working creatively across disciplines uh, and practices can help to create cultural meanings and emotional engagements with this issue. So I'm going to focus on two collaborative climate arts projects that I was involved in. Uh, one that uses visual media as a basis for exploring communication, and that's it, it's the skin you're living in and one that uses creative play as a form of youth engagement, and that's Future Coast Youth. And I'll argue that we need to be working together in ways that are creative, caring and challenging in order to better envision different and more hopeful climate futures. So making climate change visible and ordinary. So let me go back in recent time for a moment in order to reflect on how far we've come in terms of communicating climate change. Some of the first attempts at communicating climate change and give it meaning were made by environmental groups or NGOs. In analysing early efforts to communicate climate change, 10 years ago I argued that climate change posed a crisis of representation. A temporally and spatially complex issue, climate change is essentially invisible until its impacts can be seen. Presenting difficulties for its knowability in the context of Western news media culture that prioritises the visual as a primary form of representation and communication. International and environmental groups were equally bound by this commitment to the visual as a uh, persuasive form of communication, and particularly an uh, environmental group like Greenpeace, who can be accredited as the first international environmental group to make climate change a key campaign issue in the early 1990s, and actually produced uh, a written report uh, which translated or tried to communicate the first IPCC report in 1990. It didn't actually include any images. Yet Greenpeace is an NGO that's invested in the power of the visual. 
and particularly photography, to identify and communicate in environmental issues. Therein lies a problem. So, uh, in 1997, Greenpeace UK launched a campaign that focused upon the UK government's exploration um, of the northwest coast of Scotland for new oil. This campaign sought to link oil production uh, and the burning of fossil fuels to climate change or global warming, as it was more commonly referred to then. Uh, called Putting the Lid on Fossil Fuels, the campaign report uses the image of a red glowing earth to signify increasing global temperatures. Computer model simulations of climate data across the bottom signify scientific predictions about future warming if the burning of fossil fuels continued. So in some way they work as both indexical and speculative images. Talking to the public on the streets of Brighton and Hove at the time about how new oil exploration and the burning of fossil fuels was linked to global warming was a very difficult task. Invariably, we were met with responses that included, it's in the future, and I can't see it, so it's not happening. In 1997, when the polar bear had not yet emerged as a visual icon of climate change and climate impacts imagery was scarce, the images in the report are a credible attempt at telling a visual story about the causes, effects and solutions to climate change. Photographs of oil platforms on the opening page established an associative link between oil and climate change. Climate change effects are conveyed by four photographs uh, placed together that depict devastation to buildings and landscape by wind and water, signs of an already warming world 20 years ago. At the end of the report, a photograph of a group of children surrounding a solar panel is used to metonymically signify the future and a solution to climate change. Later efforts from Greenpeace conveyed the reality of climate change through the power of visual uh, evidence, where the indexical or the denotative function of photography was called upon, and still is, to demonstrate the visible loss of glaciers over time as a result of a warming climate. And I also want to point out the kind of aesthetic function of these images as well, watching the beauty of um, visual landscapes being lost. Yet these images are um, a focus upon the visual representation of landscapes and often animals at risk from climate change at the expense of humans who are intimately entwined within this unfolding story. And as such, these images reinforce a problematic distinction between nature and culture, rendering climate change an issue um, that's beyond human culture, out there, somewhere, spatially distant and in the future, knowable only through particular uh, visual images that prioritise impacts to land and to animals. So 10 years ago, I argued that we need a broader repertoire of climate imagery and communication that included humans, not just animal species and landscapes at risk, and that enabled a wider understanding that not all environmental issues are visible, and that more hopeful and localised narratives of climate solutions and engagements could be created. 10 years on, we could argue the images of climate change have proliferated to offer a richer visual narrative, extending beyond climate impacts to endeavour to include everyday activities, uh, help to mitigate climate change. So this is recent work by a charity called Climate Outreach, and it's a climate visuals project, uh, an image database, and this is a good example of how images are being used uh, to shift focus away from climate impacts, to focus upon the human, the everyday, um, emotions and solutions uh, to create new stories. So we know that images are powerful and persuasive forms of communication, but it's not simply a produce of produ case of producing more visuals of climate change, but thinking about how those images give meaning to climate change, for whom and for what, and what kinds of participation they invite. How do we visualise the pasts, presents and futures of climate change that link to people's everyday lives to facilitate collective visions of society to emerge? Environmental human rights and um, some media outlets such as The Guardian have made an editorial de uh, decision to divest from, from fossil fuels and to increase journalistic content about climate change. Um, and in many ways, climate change, however, still remains an invisible issue um, culturally, both within and across mainstream media and popular culture. 
going back to a quite an old theorist, uh, Raymond Williams, cultural theorist, reminds us that culture is ordinary. It is a whole way of life. So culture is comprised of the lived daily experiences and the significations or representations that circulate within society. And these representations and experiences work together to create a shared set of beliefs, values and meanings that form culture. But culture is not fixed. As William says, it's in people's minds and in society. So climate change has been dependent upon science to identify its causes, its development, and to make predictions about its likely developments over space and time according to different mitigation scenarios. But how we make sense of and address climate change is a cultural issue. For example, we know that the acceleration of greenhouse gas emissions since the 19th century is attributable to the development of modern industrial and consumer society. Consumerism itself is a cultural practice. Um, the consumption of goods and services, which generates a whole set of meanings and values related to people's notions of happiness, identity and status. Western lifestyles and cultures are embedded within the story of climate change, in the food that we eat, the way that we travel, what we wear and what we buy, and thus our responses to addressing climate change should also be cultural. Yet how much of this understanding of the embeddedness of climate change within our cultural practices is part of our lived daily experiences, part of the signs that circulate within society? As Williams reminds us, he says that culture has two aspects, the known meanings and directions which its members are trained to, and another one which are the new observations and meanings which are offered and tested. And I guess that's what we're trying to do uh, in this uh, symposium. So climate change challenges us to question existing cultural meanings and directions in terms of our lifestyles and to offer new ones. In order to do this, we need to engage with our everyday practices and significations that comprise culture and cultural activity. Over the years, there has been an increase in the visual arts and fictional engagement with climate change. Film itself has tended to focus upon high-profile celebrity documentaries. For example, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, Leonardo DiCaprio's The Eleventh Hour, and most recently, Before the Flood. Um, we also have Chasing Ice and the sci-fi documentary The Age of Stupid. Uh, besides the Norwegian political th thriller Occupied on Netflix and Showtime's Hollywood blockbuster TV show Years of Living Dangerously, where are the mainstream media and popular cultural outputs? The TV shows, the music, the film, the games, the sport, the children's programmes that engage with climate change to make it visible and meaningful in the here and now, that help contribute to our understanding of and discussions about how we adapt to and mitigate climate change. We know that we don't need climate images as forms of truth, we need them as tools of cultural engagement and political engagement that encourage us to understand the complexity of climate change, but also invite us to participate in both imagining and creating more sustainable societies. So the second part, collaboration, creativity and hopeful change. Um, so no, recently, Neymarnis, Asberg and Hedron um, recently issued four directions for environmental humanities. The first one is that we need to move beyond negative framings of climate change. We need to avoid technocratic approaches. We need to overcome the intangibility of climate change. And we also need to overcome the compartmentalization of nature and culture. So to truly address these directions and to offer ways forward, I think collaboration, interdisciplinarity and creativity are required. If we remind ourselves that in 2005, um, Bill McKibben, a climate change activist and writer, argued that we need more uh, arts engagement with climate change. He said that we can register what is happening with satellites and scientific instruments, but can we register it in our imaginations, the most sensitive of all devices? So working across disciplines and with non-academic partners is absolutely crucial to sharing and creating knowledge and expertise and to benefit from the positivity and of the challenges of working with and learning from uh, others outside of your discipline or your practice. So in 2009, I was involved in the Levy Hume Trust Artist in Residence project with David Haradine, who's our artistic director of the performance company Fevered Sleep. 
Our aim was to use the visual media of film to question dominant images of climate impacts, to try and produce different kinds of climate images that were more embodied and which questioned problematic nature-culture distinctions. As such, the residency explicitly situated it itself within two kind of conceptual frameworks and communities of practice. So from um, David's perspective, arts engagement with climate change um, can or may focus upon the poetic, the imaginative, the emotional and the sensory as a way of unearthing and revealing different ways of seeing, uh, perceiving and understanding our changing climate. From my perspective, environmental communication and media scholars typically explore the ways in which climate change is mediated through media and cultural practices, seeking to understand how climate is constructed, communicated and contested in order to facilitate social and political change. So in the residency, we asked how can these different ways of seeing or making meaning be brought together in the context of climate communication? So we set up a kind of another conceptual framework. We were particularly interested in focusing upon four different themes, the visual, time and temporality, embodiment, and place, space, and landscape. We know that in terms of the visual, climate change itself is invisible until its impacts can be seen. So this is a problem within a visually dominated culture. We know that the polar bear has been a, an icon that's been created to communicate climate change, but it renders climate change as non-human and distant. Time and temporality. Um, environmental sociologist Barbara Adam reminds us that clock time is at odds with environmental time. Organic environmental time is rhythmical, cyclical and interconnected. In contrast, clock or machine time as a product of science fixes time, making it singular and isolated from the processes of life. Embodiment. Images of climate impacts historically, although I think there is a shift uh, in more recent years, have historically focused upon animal bodies at the expense of humans. It becomes distance and distancing. So how can we think about and reconfigure uh, that notion of embodiment to focus on the human? And in place, space and landscape, landscapes are visible maps, space, spaces and places that we've seen from um, both uh, previous presentations. They can often become representative of nature and environment, but again, humans are often removed from these spaces, reinforcing nature, culture and human animal distinctions. So how can we reconfigure landscape as an urban space? Um, spaces experienced through cultural values of identity, belonging and home. And we know that climate change will dissolve neat geographical borders, but also reinforce political borders. So how can we think in a more complex way about those issues? So we set ourselves a, a high task um, and we found it really difficult. So we thought in true art style, we'd create a manifesto to try and, um, I guess, accumulate and represent all the things that we were trying to do in just one artwork. Um, so we said it must not be literal. It must make me feel something. It must not only be confined to an art space. It must have an element of sound. It must complicate our experience of time. It must include the human. It must not contain images in which polar bears appear to be cute. It must be playful, but it must be deadly serious. It must not be singular. It must not use un unrecontextualized images of climate impacts. It must consider its audience. It must appear in more than one place, or in more than one form, in more than one place, and more than one time. And it must be mobile. I'm going to show you the first four minutes of the eight-minute film that um, David went on to produce as, as a result of the residency. Yeah, thanks. El sonido está conectado. Just to say, despite our best efforts, we kept coming back to the image of the polar bear. Okay. 
And so the polar bear goes on a journey from Svalbard, which is strange because that's where the WWF uh, polar bear comes from, uh, through the Scottish Hebrides, through a Bedfordshire dairy farm, past the M11 motorway in the UK, um, to a house in London to make a cup of tea. Um, because climate change is not just about polar bears. It's about the skin you're living in. So the film exists as a standalone film, a multimedia installation, and a mobile app. Um, and it's been shown in arts contexts, museums, and in some public spaces. So we tried to cover as much of the manifesto as we could. But if we're working to make climate change ordinary and part of our everyday lives, then this should include focusing upon issues around agency, empowerment and self-efficacy. And in this context, young people are a crucial group to engage with uh, and understand how their perceptions of climate change might impact upon their sense of efficacy and agency um, in undertaking pro-environmental behaviours. Did research by Maria Ojala has found that pessimism about addressing climate change uh, increases with age, particularly from early to late adolescence, with more individual rather than collective responses developing and also uh, technocratic responses to sustainability increase over that age period as well. So young people are an essential group to engage with and learn from um, in terms of how climate change feelings inform efficacy and how these shift um, problematically over time. So Future Coast Youth was a collaborative research project that employed creativity and participation to engage young people with climate change. It was a partnership um, between the University of Brighton Media Researchers, Onca Centre for Arts and Ecology uh, in Brighton, and Dorothy Stringer High School, which is also in Brighton in the UK. And the project was funded by the University of Brighton's Community University Partnership Programme. So Future Coast Youth uh, used participatory play and storytelling to enable young people to imagine and explore their responses to climate change. And it also wanted to ask how can play and storytelling create a sense of uh, self-efficacy and agency in relationship to climate change. Um, Future Coast um, Youth extended the Future Coast online digital storytelling project that was developed by US games designer Ken Eklund. Uh, which asks audiences to imagine and create a range uh, of voicemails, uh, well, create their own voicemails from a range of climatically changed futures. Um, it's a way of linking on and offline play um, and physical objects called chronofacts, and that's the image on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, are placed in different geographical locations with gamers following GPS data in real time to find those chronofacts. Then they type the serial number on the chronofact into the website and that would release a particular voicemail from the future and then gamers could also create their own voicemails. So here speculative storytelling is used to help, is kind of used in order to imagine future climate change but from the context of the present every day and to help traverse those perceived temporal and spatial uh, distance of climate change. So with Eklund's support, uh, Future Coast Youth built on this participatory imaginative uh, premise to explore young people's perceptions of climate change in Brighton and Hove. Um, we worked with 12 environmental science GCSE students. <clears throat> that, they were aged 14 to 15 years. That was six girls, six boys, all white. A workshop format was devised to enable the students to produce their own creative climate outputs. So that was kind of the end goal. Those workshops were facilitated by Persephone Pell from Onca and independent art facilitators Keith Ellis and Jack Darash. And they used playfulness and play in particular ways. And um, they used it games to increase group bonding and confidence uh, and to build confidence within that group play to explore young people's perceptions of climate change and also an immersive and participatory play um, to introduce students to the project um, and that was used as a framing device for the project i'm going to talk about that in a moment so all the way through the project the students were referred to as a future coast youth team um, dedicated to addressing climate change in positive ways and future coast youth project actually took up in the 
took place in the lead up to COP21 um, and culminated in a Young People's Climate Conference at Onca Gallery with students presenting their work in role as a climate dele youth climate delegation from the future and the opening of the, um, that coincided with the actual opening day of COP21 in Paris. Um, so, we utilised the format of Eklund's Future Co. Students were introduced to the project through an immersive play experience at Onca, which became the frictional Brighton headquarters of Future Coast. So, Future Coast was a fictitious network of groups dedicated to addressing climate change. So, the students were invited to HQ, and the teachers and themselves were addressed as members or special agents of the Future Coast youth team, and thus became active participants in the story. So the project facilitators took on a series of climate characters in the story. Um, Agent Y, who's the person on the right, is Persephone Pearl. She was the enthusiastic climate activist and grassroots organiser. Dr Agent Watt, which is myself in the middle, was the extremely concerned climate scientist prone to using apocalyptic language. And Howard the Caterer, Jack Darash on the left, was the dissenting sceptic serving tea and biscuits uh, to the young special agents. So each character presented a kind of um, particular social or political actor, an activist, a scientist and a sceptic, although these were obviously in very ex exaggerated manners. So in doing so, we wanted to um, show how different positions and perspectives could be articulated through those characters in engaging and humorous ways that called upon the students to participate in the debate and dialogue. Um, I was going to sh um, let you hear how Agent Y introduced the um, format of the day to the students, but it seems to have popped off the slide. I don't know if it might be on the... Okay. Yes. So this is what the students heard when they came into the, in the gallery. Hello. Hello. Come in quickly. Quickly. Did anybody see you? We are under surveillance. Yes. Shut the door. Shut the door. Yes. <clears throat> Sit down. Cup of tea. Thank you all for coming through the rain, this terrible weather crisis which is underway. We are so thrilled to welcome you, agents to the Brighton headquarters of Future Coast, a truly global grassroots organisation, a network of Future Coast organisations all around the world addressing climate change. It is great to have such an amazing influx of new agents joining Team Future Coast. This is Agent Watt and I am Agent Y and we have brought you here today to give you a top secret briefing. For several years, strange objects have been appearing in clusters at random locations all around the world. Here, here, here. Through our secret research, we've been able to discover that information from the future is encoded into the structure of these objects. There is some kind of glitch in the space-time continuum, and occasionally these things, which we call chronofacts, pour through in events that we call chronofalls. <gasps> Our work is secret because what we have learned from these chronofacts, agents, has huge implications for society. And you have come to this briefing, agents, because we need your help to unlock more chronofacts and decode the messages that they contain. What they are showing is that there are an infinite number of possible futures and that what we do here and now, today, shapes those futures. And some of the possible futures we are learning about are very bleak. And our scientist, Agent Dr Watt, is here to explain what happens if the problems that cause this are not addressed in the present. <laughs> So after the introduction, the overwhelming evidence of climate science was presented to the students with urgency by Dr. Watt. Agent Y endeavoured to keep um, the 
the mood positive around uh, climate solutions and climate engagement, and Howard intervened with Tea and Biscuits, then stormed out of HQ in outrage when Dr Watt talked about irredeemable catastrophe. Within minutes, Agent Y received a phone call from another Future Coast agent informing us that there had been a Krona fall in the area. Amidst the excitement and anticipation, Howard the caterer fell through the door, having been hit on the head by a falling Krona fact. So Agent Y asked the agents to read out the encoded messages, uh, encoded number on the Krona fact, which released three voicemails from the future. Once the voicemails had been decoded, um, all of us stepped out of character uh, and of the immersive play, and we tasked the students to produce their own voicemails in pairs or individually. Overwhelmingly, students' voicemails focused upon loss, species extinction, societal changes, war over resources, famine, rioting, and also te technological changes, a renewable transport that works and then doesn't work. Um, what was interesting was that gender differences in communication mode and content emerged. The boys adopted a factual newsreader approach to their voicemails, um, whilst the girls all created personal messages that were either sent to or referenced family members and events, integrating the personal and the everyday within broader social and cultural conditions. Um, but there was a mixture of loss and emotion. Most frighteningly, one of the voicemails from uh, the group of girls um, had sent all old people to Antarctica because they were no longer economically viable, and one of the voicemails was ringing up their grandmother who was in Antarctica. Um, so... It's a good insight into how young people are thinking about climate change. Uh, rules of play continued, some anyway, rules of play continued in the workshops that we held at Dorothy Stringer School. So again, when they entered the classrooms, they were addressed as the Future Coast Youth Team dedicated to addressing climate change. And for the rest of the hour, we don't focus solely on climate change solutions. So the goal of the workshop was to try and get the students to think about what kind of creative output they would like to produce of their own linked to any topic related to climate change. So so students were really knowledgeable about the causes of climate change. Obviously, they were environmental science students. Um, they were very clear about technological solutions and behavioural changes, such as walking, cycling, and using less water. But concurring with existing research find, findings, student thought, students thought that governments were responsible for action, uh, people at the top, and they didn't see themselves as being responsible for action. So we then introduced the idea of imagination and story-based communication, saying to them that you can't make changes or create new ideas unless you can imagine them first. So with the help of the tutor, we, uh, to keep the students on task, which is a, uh, a quite a difficult task outside of the workshops, the students presented their work at Onca to an invited audience on the first day of COP. So they worked in collaboration with the project leaders to co-create the format of the presentation. We hadn't decided before the day what we were going to do. Um, so students themselves decided to play in character as delegates from the climate conference in need of some light relief via a game show. So the format was that they uh, compare, stood up and asked a question, and one of the students would answer, and with that answer they would um, present their creative output. These are just a range of some of the creative outputs, um, a poster on living roofs, a poster on talks about threats to amphibians, uh, Indonesian rainforests, a blog on renewables, and poetry about food and air miles. Um, there was also an illustrated brochure on top predators and a manga comic strip on climate engagement. Um, and also a new climate icon was found, uh, a kitten on an iceberg. How about you? Um, so students expressed enjoyment about the playful and creative approach that we'd taken. Um, Jack said, I like the lighter approach towards global action rather than send people into despair with horrifying facts. Melanie said, I like that we were able to express our ideas and thoughts through creative mediums. It made us able to see climate change in a different light. By the end, they expressed increased confidence in their own agency through knowledge acquisition or the ability to communicate more effectively. Again, these findings were gendered. Uh, boys were more concerned with acquiring knowledge and techno solutions and individual approaches, whilst the girls were more concerned about communicating, connectivity and spreading awareness. Uh, Colin says, I feel more confident about fixes to climate change. And John says, I now feel as an individual I can make a difference. Natalie said, I feel more confident because stuff I did on the website. So we um, presented all their work via the website uh, for people to see. It's like spreading awareness. Now I'm more confident that everything is connected and in public speaking. Uh, 
So playfulness and creativity did work productively to enable the students to think and feel differently about climate change. But this was really dependent upon trusted communicators. And in this role, it was the teacher um, who gave us access to the students in the first instance, who also kept the pupils on track outside the workshops um, and allowing us into their classrooms. And undertaking this project made me feel something that I hadn't felt for a while. That was hopeful. So to conclude, I began this talk with a fake news story about, uh, which asked us to both imagine and believe the impacts of current climate uh, change to animals and their habitats. I then wondered how telling this story differently through the image of a climate refugee would alter the narrative and the meaning. I've also spoken about climate stories in the news, media, popular culture and environmental NGOs. Um, about harnessing creativity, communication and emotion through collaboration as a means of producing different kinds of co-created, I think that's really important, co-creation, um, climate change encounters and engagements. But we know that we enter a period of increased political polarisation with attacks on liberal ideals and the resurgence of the far right, even though we do see hopes of the left emerging as well. There does appear a renewed public discourse uh, of us and them, legitimate and illegitimate, perpetuated through languages and images. And in this context, it's really easy to feel despair about addressing climate change, um, thinking about the complexities of the issue, thinking about them with care and compassion rather than overwhelm and despair, or through fear and competition. And we can't do this alone, we have to work together creatively and collaboratively across disciplines and across practices. And we have to care and to care fiercely in our ordinary lives. So how and what we imagine and communicate about climate change matters. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for this uh, travel and for sharing with us uh, some of the methods that you applied. Uh, I tend to think that the playfulness and also effabulation that Julia addressed in her introduction uh, is a really good way to, um, to approach new sensibilities and uh, bring problems to the table in diverse angles and yeah. stress further how we're thinking. Just now, uh, most of us, the location we're at, had the Environmental Week and there was an exhibition, maybe it's still on, on most of 2030. Okay. So speculations about the present tense and our last guest, uh, Esqualita Pablo de Soto, who's working on a Fukushima archive uh, of imagery, he um, is actually developing a science fiction games and protocols for city halls to adopt. So between politicians, writers, and different communities. So I think these methods are, are quite interesting. Um, I would ask if there are questions, otherwise. Jose, uh, there is a microphone. Wait, wait, wait. Gisela has. Thank you. Um, well, um, first of all, thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. I think the, um, the whole... Um, educational framework, especially mm -hmm. at the end, was uh, a very refreshing point of view on the whole, on all of these issues. I just wanted to um, to ask you, how did you come up with the idea of using the, the because it, it's obviously the Doctor Who narrative, right? You're using Doctor What and um, <laughs> time travel, and the kids seem to be quite familiar with that sort of narrative framework from, from popular culture, which is, of course, in the UK, it's... Um, it's, I mean, several generations have grown up with it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did you come up with that idea? Whose idea was that? Or it was just, it just came up? Okay, thank you. I never linked it to Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so part of the original Future Coast project that Ken Eklund, the, the online digital storytelling project, it, it ran for um, a three-month period because it was quite intensive because they had to have people who were there all the time as soon as a you know chronofact basically the chronofacts that were the physical objects that were in geographical places that occurred mainly in the US and then we had one in, in Brighton um, so it was quite time intensive um, so part of that though was on their website they produced a guideline for doing public events so actually at the time um, in 
2014, we gave a, gave a public event and did a similar setup. So some of this, the setup is there in terms of, you know, you can take characters. They don't tell you what kind of um, names to use or having a, you know, a, a caterer. So it's kind of quite broad. So there's a, a, there's a format there that you can use, a kind of narrative that you can then um, alter according to, what, you know, your context. So the agent what, I think it was um, what's happening, climate scientist. Um, and agent why was the kind of why we need to do something about it. So I think it was more just a, a play. We were making a play on words. And agents was more about kind of the special agents in terms of this is a secret mission that we need to find out, you know, these glitches, the, chronof the chronofalls in particular areas and find out these possible futures. Um, but thanks for the link to Doctor Who. That might be why they got into it. I mean, to say that was working in that outside of the classroom was brilliant because the students, um, they were only 14 and 15. They hadn't known each other that long. They just started that course. It put them in a different perspective. And I think it was as if you were, they felt valued as, as people. Um, as soon as you went back into the classroom, it was a very different atmosphere. It was much more difficult to engage with them. Um, they were very aware of the tutor being there, um, who was great, but, but it's a different context. And yeah, so I'd certainly, if you're doing kind of any educational pedagogical work, taking the students out of their normal environment is really great. And tea and biscuits or any kind of refreshments are brilliant for the students because that's what they, you know, kept coming up with this, you know, there's something about being provided with um, refreshments that was really important for them and so they kind of forgot themselves within that and, and engaged but then it was more difficult to do that in the classroom context. Do you know if there are uh, data banks or online platforms that assimilate different methodologies experience done around pedagogy and climate change? I think this would be a really valuable yeah. tool for sharing uh, mm -hmm. No, I mean, that was one of the output, well, one of the concerns that we wanted to do was to kind of use this as a test mm -hmm. tester and then produce some, you know, some of the materials on mm -hmm. the website. We haven't got around to doing that, but that's certainly something we want to do. Um, yeah. But also just to say in that context, I mean, we want to also do that with different types of students. So how would drama students or art students or... It, Obviously, those students at that age are taking different classes, but the way that you present it within the context of environmental science is very particular. But the tutor in the curriculum, climate change actually came at the very end of that two-year curriculum in environmental science. As a result of the project, their tutor brought climate change to the very front of the curriculum because it was the start of the course. And the feedback from the tutor was, this is brilliant because obviously climate change is the context for all the other subsequent issues. So, but yeah. So. I don't know if there are any more questions or we save them for the round debate and mm -hmm. we gather all our speakers and have our respondents coming in. Yeah.